Wirral, a hundred square miles of peninsula and historically part of the ancient county of Cheshire, is now largely administered as a single unit known as Wirral Metropolitan Borough, which in turn is part of the newer administrative county of Merseyside. Wirral lies between two rivers, the Mersey flowing down from the Pennines and the Dee from Bala Lake in North Wales. It's had links with Liverpool since the 12th century, when monks from the Priory at Birkenhead began a cross-river ferry service. In 1330, they were granted a charter by King Edward III to run a ferry service forever. From a population of a few hundred, Wirral rapidly expanded with the coming of steam ferries. It became a dormitory for Liverpool merchants, and then later, the site for major industries pioneered by two men. John Laird, whose now silent shipyard overlooks his grave in the Priory grounds, was largely responsible for the development of Birkenhead in Victorian times, although it was his father, William Laird, who laid the foundations. He established a shipyard in Wallasey Pool and the beginnings of Hamilton Square in the 1820s. Birkenhead eventually became a new town and a new town improvement commission was established. Under the chairmanship of John Laird, it was a go-ahead place willing to try new ideas. The new town hall was built. In 1860, it was the first to try a purpose-designed tramway introduced by George Francis Train from America. The line ran from Woodside Ferry Terminal to Birkenhead Park. The public park, designed by Joseph Paxton, was the first of its kind in the country. The sale of building plots on the periphery were to pay for the innovation. Parks in other towns and other countries were based on it, including Central Park in New York. The second industrialist, a Lancashire man from Bolton, came later in the century, in 1888, and founded a new soap factory on marshy ground on the Mersey coast and called it Port Sunlight after his established brand of soap. William Hesketh Lever also built a village to house many of his workers so that they'd have a pleasant place to live. He built the Lady Lever Art Gallery in memory of his late wife. Alongside the gallery is a splendid memorial to the founder, but his true memorial must be the village itself with its wide variety of housing designed by many different architects. Apart from the two major towns of Wallasey and Birkenhead, where most of the population live, Wirral consists of several old villages, Bidston from the 12th century being one of the oldest. St Oswald's Church Tower dates from the 16th century. Bidston has been a conservation area since 1971. The nearby Bidston Hill, with its mill, was bought by a far-sighted Birkenhead Corporation in 1893 as a public open space. The mill last worked in the 1870s and is a vantage point for looking towards Liverpool and was used as a flag signalling point for Liverpool ship owners to notify them of the arrival of ships in Liverpool Bay. Thornton Huff, with its replica Norman Church of St George and Parish Church of All Saints and Village Green, is small but picturesque. It was developed to the way it looks today by Joseph Hurst and later by William Lever, who took up residence in nearby Thornton Manor. Some of its houses are similar to those in Port Sunlight. Park Gate on the Dee was a thriving fishing village and seaport for Ireland, but in the last century the river has gradually silted up and now the water only reaches the quayside a few times a year at the highest tides. It's a favoured spot with visitors and has a number of historical connections. It's said that when Handel was on his way to Ireland to give his first performance of the Messiah, stormy weather delayed the departure of the Dublin packet and so he used the unexpected waiting time to put the finishing touches to the oratorio here at Parkgate. Also on the Dee coast, West Kirby has been a popular venue for day trippers since the railways came. It's an area that is partly responsible for Wirral's projected tourist image as the Leisure Peninsula. In the distance, Hilbury Island Nature Reserve is accessible only at low tide. At the mouth of the Mersey, New Brighton, a popular resort from Victorian times, 
had become run down in recent years, with many of its facilities demolished or closed. Today, it's been revamped by the Merseyside Development Corporation and still caters for the day tripper, although the emphasis has changed to residential needs. It's from Wallasey Town Hall that most of Wirral is now administered. Its southern strip, taking in Ellesmere Port and Neston, is a separate unit within the county of Cheshire. Our story of Wirral Past begins at Bebbington Station, not the Mersey Rail Station of today, but back in 1919 on the London and North Western and Great Western Railways joint line from Birkenhead to Chester, where we board the train to Port Sunlight. Our three-quarter mile journey takes us alongside Port Sunlight Village. The Lady Lever Art Gallery is under construction and will be completed in about three years' time. In the distance is Christ Church, built for the first Lord Leverhulme at his own expense as an interdenominational church. Today, it is United Reformed Church. The circle is for the war memorial, still to be made for the great war to end all wars, ended only last year. At Port Sunlight Private Halt, frequent trains offload hundreds of Lever Brothers staff. Some will change onto the train on the bay platform on the left to be taken by Lever's private train and rail network to the Brumbra Margarine Works and Industrial Estate. Opposite the station is the post office, which is still a feature of the village of the 1990s. The Lever Free Library later became the Heritage Centre and the District Bank has become NatWest. Port Sunlight Fire Brigade also provides a service not restricted to Port Sunlight and frequent practice is necessary to combat the real thing. Behind the scenes, work carries on and we take a look at some of the transport systems.
Port Sunlight Dock on the River Dibbin receives raw materials such as palm kernels, coconuts and groundnuts for the crushing mill. Materials from all parts of the world will have been transshipped from larger ocean-going vessels in the Mersey. Rail transport was used for the dispatch of most finished products, although some motor traffic and horse-drawn vehicles were used locally. Some parts of the country would be served by coastal shipping. A train of oil tanks heads for the top siding. waste train travelling empty from the tip to the glycerine plant. At the top siding, mainline locos take over from Lever's own locomotives to deliver goods to all parts of the country via a very large nationwide rail network. Lunch break as workers relax outside the works. As we move to 1929, camel lairds are major shipbuilders having been established about a hundred years. Lairds amalgamated with Steelmaker's Camel in 1903. Birkenhead docks and locomotives are exported to all parts of the empire and the rest of the world. Three o'clock on the 19th of August, 1931, and cloud bursts are seen in Lower Tranmere on Union Street and Newchester Road. Half an inch of rain falls in 20 minutes. Newchester Road between St Paul's and Woodside is one foot deep in water in the space of an hour, but apparently Oldchester Road nearby is two feet deep and Borough Road forms a raging torrent. Parts of Liverpool are flooded. Burtonhead's trams are in their last year of operation on the new ferry route, which will close at the end of December. The petrol station is still on the site in the background, and behind that is the sub-power station for the tramway. Sunshine again, and soon everything is back to normal in Parkinson's Dairy in Union Street.
Wednesday, the 18th of July, 1934, and in brilliant sunshine, the first Mersey Road Tunnel is officially opened. Uniting Lancashire and Cheshire, it's described as the greatest engineering achievement to date. Over a nine-year construction period, it cost eight million pounds and is 2.13 miles long, excluding the branch tunnels. At the Birkenhead entrance, built on the site of the Birkenhead Library, donated to the town by Andrew Carnegie, there are three miles of crowds with people finding vantage points by climbing onto rooftops and clinging to chimneys. At 11 o'clock, the band of the Grenadier Guards, dressed in scarlet and bearskins, play the British Grenadiers. The 4th, 5th Battalion of the Cheshire Regiment, based at Chester, lines the tunnel entrance. Supporting are the Birkenhead Institute Scout Troop. BBC relay speakers record progress in Liverpool. Lord Derby is in overall control. Captain A.C. Dawson, Birkenhead Chief Constable, looks after arrangements in Birkenhead. King George V and Queen Mary complete their journey through the tunnel, accompanied by Transport Minister Leslie Hoare Belisha of Belisha Beacon fame, and Lady-in-waiting Dowager Countess of Airlie. Among those receiving the royal party are Mayor James Coulthard, Lord Leverhulme, local MP Graham White, town clerk E.W. Tame, and chief librarian John Shepherd. After speeches, the town clerk hurries across to introduce Birkenhead's oldest inhabitant, Samuel Gillingham, to the king. They chatted about the royal telegram sent to Mr. Gillingham on his 100th birthday. The party move off and drive around the town, up Grange Road via Charing Cross, to the new central library, replacing the one demolished for the new tunnel entrance. The royals are greeted by Alderman Sully, chairman of the Libraries, Museums and Arts Committee and father of the council. Pressing a jewelled lever later given to the king, the new library is declared open. Among the crowd are cadets from HMS Conway and Birkenhead School. The Chinese laundry opposite displays both the British and Chinese flags. The King and Queen move on to Rock Ferry Station to join the Royal Train. Notice the tram lines in Borough Road. Also in 1934, Founders' Day is celebrated at Bevington Oval. It's in honour of the first Lord Leverhulme, founder of Port Sunlight. It was an annual event that lasted until the early 1950s. Chester Motor Club display their skills. run off with the cup. Now here's an unusual event, football on motorcycles, with England represented by Chester Motor Club. The match consists of three 20-minute sections with five-minute intervals between each. Changing ends is done midway through the second section. In addition to the referee, there are four linesmen and goal judges. The English team includes Colin Edge, who ran Bevington Driving School for many years.
France win 6-3. Again in 1934, we have Bebbington Garden Fate, led by three rose queens through Port Sunlight Village via Bebbington Road to New Ferry Park. Zoo Band. It was always a horse parade. Ace Sir Alan Cobham visited Wirral with his flying circus for National Air Days in 1933, 34 and 35. Registration letters on the aircraft help identify this as the 17th or 18th of June 1933 with two performances each day at 2.15 and 6pm at Arrow House Farm, Upton. In 1924, Sir Alan was the first aviator to fly from London to Australia and back by seaplane. Aircraft here include a de Havilland 83 Fox Moth, an Avro 504K from Hooton Park, and an airspeed AS4 ferry carrying passengers on pleasure flights. A mini Schneider Trophy race was part of the event. The 10th of October 1934 and Camel Laird launched their 1,000th ship, the 5,000 ton Clement, for the Booth Steamship Company. Mrs. Clement Jones performs the launching ceremony. New Brighton has been a place for days out for many generations of people from Liverpool and Wirral. New Brighton Baths, said to be the largest outdoor pool at the time, was opened by Lord Leverhulme in 1934. 
In 1936, a diving championship takes place. At the western end, in 1929, before the promenade was built, Harrison Drive was a favourite place for swimming and relaxing. In 1929 and 1930, beach bungalows are taken for the season and often people would like others to see them in their very best clothes. Seacombe Ferry was largely used by commuters and connected at regular 10-minute intervals with Wallace's frequent bus services, most of which terminated at the ferry entrance shown here in 1936. Heavy seas off Egremont occurred from time to time, this being a particularly bad storm in 1938.
The coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth is celebrated on the 12th of May 1937 in Priory Court, Birkenhead. Priory Court was situated a few yards from Birkenhead Priory and is now the site of a small industrial estate. Street parties were everywhere on this day, and this is one of Birkenhead's most important ones, as it's visited by the mayor, George Prentice. After the war, Priory Court disappeared to be replaced by industry. One wonders how many of these people survived the severe bombing of 1941 and what happened to the members of what is obviously a very close-knit community. Until 1938, steam trains from New Brighton and Wakerby connected with the electrified Mersey Railway at Birkenhead Park for the journey under the Mersey to Liverpool. During 1937, the third rail system of electrification was installed on these branches and stations reconstructed in a 1930 architectural style. Trains would now be able to run directly through to Liverpool, saving valuable minutes, and were cleaner and more convenient. Mersey Railway's old-fashioned American-style trains, now more than 30 years old, would operate to New Brighton, but brand new ones from the LMS would go to West Kirby. However, on Sundays, they swapped around. The 14th of March 1938 is the official opening. 
the last official steam train brings the Mayor of Wallasey, A.W. Vickery Scoynes, the Mayor of Birkenhead, Charles McVeigh, and Liverpool's Lord Mayor, M. Corey Dixon, with the Chairman of the LMS Railway, Josea Stamp, to West Kirby, to be greeted by the Chairman of Hoylake and West Kirby Urban District Council, Selwyn Lloyd. The official party depart by new electric train number 28689, which coincidentally is the last remaining train, now named Ivor T. Davis and preserved by Wirral Borough Council. It ran in service for nearly 50 years. Thursday, the 28th of July, 1938, and a proud day in the history of Camel Lairds. The new Mauritania is launched. After fitting out, she departed on her maiden voyage on the 17th of June, 1939. Only months later, her luxurious fittings were removed and she was converted into a troop ship that covered the globe. Surviving the war, she re-entered passenger service in 1946, being finally scrapped in 1965. In summertime, people generally walked to Raby Mir, although there was a bus service for a period. The Mir was a pleasant, picturesque attraction with a small pleasure ground and cafe and rowing boats for hire. In the winter, the scene changed. Hard winters in the 30s gave the opportunity for ice skaters to enjoy themselves. Many families bought ice skates specially for these winter occasions. Bidston Mill, silent since the 1870s, here with its fairly new sails which were replaced in the 1920s and again in the 1980s. scenes at Thurston Church and Bidston Church. the old suspension bridge that spanned the road cutting through Bidston Hill. Park Gate on the River Dee with a sandy shore at much lower level than the weed which would develop in the next few decades. Thornton Huff's village smithy under the spreading chestnut tree, a tribute to the first Lord Leverhulme's revamping of the village. Rugby at Bebbington Oval, Port Sunlight play Liverpool in 1932. It was a hotly contested match. Liverpool forwards break away. Port Sunlight take the ball. Mm -hmm. 
Eric Clark ports her night back clears. In 1938 and 39, the Birkenhead ferries are busy as usual. The luggage boat Bebbington, built in 1925 by Camel Laird, still operates in spite of the competition from the new Mersey Tunnel and will continue until 1941. We leave Liverpool Pier Head, passing the new streamlined trams in the terminal loops, and head for Rock Ferry. Nearing our destination, we pass near the Naval Cadet Training Ship Conway, here since 1876. Behind, in the distance, is the Indefatigable, a naval school for orphans and deprived children. Both moved to Anglesey in 1941 to avoid the bombing, but Conway was wrecked when she broke her back on rocks in the Menai Strait after the war. Indefatigable was scrapped. It's now the 30th of June, 1939, and on a light summer evening at 10.20 p.m., we wait for the last ferry from Rock Ferry to Liverpool. The Upton, another Camelad product, operates the service for which it was built in 1925. Gangplank is raised for the last time. It's farewell to a ferry that lasted in municipal hands from 1899. It's 1939. Let's take the ferry to New Brighton, a trip that sadly is no longer possible. Many from the heart of Wirral would take a bus to Woodside, the ferry to Liverpool, and then change to the New Brighton boat. This pre-war colour film has mellowed with age and is evocative of the era. The Tower Open Air Fairground is a favourite place for many and remains so up to its closure in the 1960s. The Tower Building houses a large dance floor, a popular place for Saturday nights. Originally there was a tower on top of the building. It was even higher than Blackpool's but not as tall as the Eiffel. This unfortunately was dismantled around the time of the First World War. What an attraction it would be today. Two forty five PM on the twentieth of May, nineteen thirty nine, and Alderman J. G. Storey, Chairman of the Works Committee, cuts the tape to open the new promenade extension from near the baths at New Brighton to three hundred yards short of Harrison Drive. This brings the full length of the promenade from Seacombe via New Brighton to eight miles. It's 
It was hoped the land behind the promenade would attract the development of new hotels and leisure activities. The Second World War would start a few months later, which would end such optimism, and the new image New Brighton was not to be. To complete our look at Wirral between the wars, we go back to where we started in 1919. Leavers staff, who don't live within walking distance of the factory, crowd the company's private station to board trains for home, or maybe, down the line, change to trams, buses or ferries. And change is the operative word, because we hope that these clips of ageing film have succeeded in portraying the changing face of Wirral down the years.